Hello everyone, we're going to get started and hopefully a few more people will trickle in. Um, my name is Jana Moore and I'm with the Epilepsy Support Network and we have Megan Metzger who's our Director of Programs. And we'll be presenting Epilepsy 101. Um, we present this presentation to the community as well as our uh, program night. Okay, so we are a, um, we are the local nonprofit 501c3 in Orange County and we have um, 25 programs that we um, uh, that we deliver to Orange County and they're all epilepsy specific for our members and according to our members they're all very essential so um, we collaborate with the medical professionals the school districts the epilepsy centers and what we're trying to do and everything we do is to help people get seizure free and um, so you'll see that all of our programs um, are to help people get seizure free and our mission is um, we are committed to building a community support to improve the lives of those affected by epilepsy through education program and advocacy so through this presentation we hope that the attendees gain a basic understanding of epilepsy and seizures and um, the effect of seizures on the brain, become familiar with diagnostic process, medical terminology, treatment options, and specialty care, epilepsy centers, and epileptologists. Also learn about epilepsy specific resources in our community. With the end goal being improved quality of life, increased independence, and safety of your loved one with epilepsy. And we do this by reducing, eliminating seizures, learning epilepsy specific practices and protocols, um, and sharing epilepsy specific resources. You can ask any questions as we go along. So basically, what is a seizure? Because it's very important. It is the uh, main symptom of epilepsy, and a seizure is a brief, abnormal, excessive, or robust discharge of electricity, um, electrical activity in the brain, and it alters one or more of the following. Movement, sensation, behaviors, and awareness. And awareness is usually the one that kind of um, shows up first. Some people um, can tell that their loved one or their student um, or the person in their care might have a seizure. There are sometimes some telltale signs. So epilepsy is a neurological condition of the brain where the main symptom is a seizure. Two or more unprovoked seizures is epilepsy. It's primarily a pediatric condition lasting into adulthood. And it's a condition that affects one in 50 children ages newborn to 18 years. And it affects one in 100 adults. One in 26 people will be diagnosed with epilepsy. And it is more common than cerebral palsy Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis combined. That's an interesting fact that a lot of people don't know. So, um, why is there such an urgency to stop seizures and to really take this condition seriously? Because approximately 50,000 people die each year in the U.S. from epilepsy. And that includes prolonged seizures, SUDEP, and seizure-related causes, accidents, um, etc. So if you can see some of the other conditions that get widespread um, uh, marketing information, uh, advocacy, etc. For instance, breast cancer. 40,600 die from breast cancer every year, so we are higher than that. But we don't have the same awareness in the United States. 15,000 die from prescription overdose, and you're hearing a lot about that. That's really big in the news. Um, 12,000 die from skin, scan, skin cancer, and every day we're worried about skin cancer and putting on our sunscreen, and we're working really hard to prevent it. So, and that's 12,000. So, 10,265 die in drunk driving accidents, and we are so aware of those and prevention and, and things to do. So I think we need to do a better job of um, of epilepsy awareness and letting people know that epilepsy is not a benign condition, but it has some very serious and um, uh, fatal side effects. So we're asking everyone to help spread the facts and raise epilepsy awareness. 
So the most important thing about epilepsy and the treatment is you really want to get a great diagnosis because it is the brain and it is so complex and it's very difficult to take a look at the brain, read the EEG, read the um, MRI. There is no specific blood test that you can take. Um, there are genetic testing that takes can take weeks or months, but you really want to um, go to an epilepsy center where they have an entire team of people working on epilepsy. Because if one of the side effects is a high death rate, then shouldn't you be going to a specialty center? Um, we send all of our um, callers to epilepsy centers so they can get the best possible and quickest diagnosis, which equates to the best possible and most effective treatment. Um, and they do a lot of tests, and these are some of the just some of the tests they do. They do so many more now with genetic testing and metabolic and mitochondrial testing. Um, so diagnosis is the key um, to getting the most effective treatment. There's medication, surgical evaluations, um, and that's neurosurgery or vagus nerve stimulator. And there's also diets, ketogenic diet, low glycemic diet, modified Atkins. The ketogenic diet's very popular right now um, with the general population who's trying to lose weight. Um, I don't think it's a four to one ratio, but people are still very interested in it. So all of these things equate to best possible seizure control. So what are the common causes of epilepsy? Well, we used to tout that we didn't know. 70% we don't know, and the other 30% um, were common identifiable causes in the brain through an MRI um, or PET scan that said there were brain anomalies, trauma, lesion, tumors, damage, congenital malformation, hypoxia, vascular um, malformations or problems, infections of the brain, meningitis, encephalitis, measles, all of them can cause da damage to the brain, which then can re result in epilepsy. There could be brain injury at birth, brain bleed, um, brain trauma, abnormal brain development, for instance, a cortical dysplasia, and um, environmental poisoning, lead, neurotoxin, chemical or gas. So all of those things can affect the brain and cause um, seizures, and that's 30%. Well, the 70% that used to be called unknown, idiopathic, cryptogenic, um, are now that we're finding is um, a lot of them are genetic, metabolic, or mitochondrial disorders. So a lot of, especially children, are getting uh, genetic panels run and to see what could be causing the very difficult to control seizures. Any questions about that? Okay. The other very common question we get is what are triggers? Everyone has different triggers. So um, these are the most common triggers, but triggers can be very unique and individual. So the most common triggers in the pediatric population are um, illness and sleep deprivation, fatigue, overheating, overexertion, stress, anxiety, hormonal changes in this order. Um, and hypoglycemia, poor diet, missed meals, uh, like a neurotoxin like caffeine, hyperventilation, flashing lights, other drug interactions including prescription or over-the-counter medications, um, recreational drugs and alcohol. For adults, it is um, missed or late medication because when parents are giving the medication, they usually don't miss. It's the adults, when they're in charge of their own medication, sometimes they miss or sometimes they forget. Because it's kind of like Groundhog Day. You know, twice a day you're taking medication, you think, I already took that. Um, so, um, and then, um, of course, uh, the next one for adults is stress and anxiety. Because that um, can lower seizure thresholds. And you can imagine adults have a lot more responsibility. So. Um, their stress and anxiety level can be very high when it comes to their epilepsy. Um, then sleep deprivation, fatigue, and illness. So those, um, they're still the same most common ones. It's just a different, um, uh, a different um, 
capacity for adults who have who have epilepsy. Okay. Any questions about the triggers? So what is the impact on everyday learning and activities? So epilepsy affects the short-term memory and and if the short-term memory is not working, then the midterm and the long-term memory is not going to work. So it affects memory, um, all types of memory. Slow processing, people with epilepsy tend, can have slower processing because the brain is firing abnormally. There could be interictal activity. That means between seizures, the brain is trying to seize. Drowsiness, inattentiveness, concentration issues, impulsivity. If you think about it, children who think, I can't rely on my brain and I better blurt out the answer right now because in two minutes I might not remember the answer. Um, you know, they have impulsivity, impulse control issues. All can be very, um, you know, very well explained by the different cognitive problems with epilepsy. Um, behavioral changes and challenges um, due to the epilepsy and also the side effects of the medication. And um, delayed social development because they're not processing the information at the rapid rate that the developing brain um, has the capacity to process information. So if there's a delayed processing, then they're not really getting all the information. Um, and for the teens, it's so important for them to get their driver's license. So we put that in their inability to get driver's license because that's so important to them. And if they don't, if they're unable to get that, then we start seeing um, increased anxiety and depression for them. Okay, supporting your loved one with epilepsy. Um, if, if they don't have seizure control, and that's what everyone wants, a seizure control, because seizure control can prevent um, SUDEP, not always, but you have a less chance of developing SUDEP, and that's the sudden um, unexpected death in epilepsy patients. And so by getting seizure control, you're reducing if the seizure is causing death, brain injury, etc., everything comes back to getting seizure control. So if you don't have seizure control, you've got to revisit the goal and say, is there room for improvement? And remember, seizure control equals independence and improved quality of life. Everyone wants an improved quality of life, right? They want their independence. They want to live the best possible life that they can. So. Um, if you're seeing isolation and dependence due to seizures and then, you know, parents are overprotecting, that can also be disabling. Um, you want to develop a seizure plan adaptable to every environment. So you do go places, you just have your plan set in place so that if there is a seizure, you have your diastat, you have your cell phone to call 911, etc. so that you're just not sitting home waiting for the next seizure or your life hasn't been reduced to waiting for the next seizure okay because that's no quality of life so we encourage all of our members to go out there and live their best life and yeah they might have seizures but if they plan for them then at least they're living the best life possible and it's definitely quality of life um, versus quantity of life um, seek out an experienced counselor for your child, teen or adult with epilepsy because it really helps to have someone to talk to besides your parents, besides your spouse, besides your family because you know they're all burned out with caring for epilepsy for years and you know they're trying to do their job and keep the insurance and all of these things so a lot of people don't tell them the truth because they don't want to add stress or anxiety. So seeing an experienced counselor is very, very helpful. So let's talk about seizure types. Um, seizure types, uh, I'm going to make this very easy, fall into two main groups. And there are focal seizures and generalized seizures. And now they have them broken, broken down to um, more groups, but for um, a family presentation, we're just going to focus on the focal and generalized seizures. So focal seizures um, can also be simple 
or complex partial, and it begins in one part of the brain, usually due to a brain anomaly, which we discussed earlier, damage, injury, insult, malformation, and then it starts, um, it can spread into the other side of the brain. So that's a focal seizure. It's coming from one area and it's spreading, okay? Um, focal seizures are considered a um, complex epilepsy and a difficult to control seizure. And they really do need um, a lot of expertise attention, um, especially um, since many focal seizures, they can do a, um, a um, evaluation for surgery to remove the focal part that's causing the seizures. And so those things can only be done at epilepsy center. So if you're already at an epilepsy center, you can go from medication trials, if you're trying one medication, you're trying another medication and you can ask your, your um, neurologist or epileptologist, can I get an evaluation for surgery? And so they can be doing that two tracks. They can be trying the medication and evaluating for surgery. So um, it's very, um, I think it's very easy and less stressful for patients that have focal epilepsy to be going to epilepsy centers. Um, and what we also know about focal seizures is they um, are progressive, or they can be progressive. So if you get them under control for one to five years, when they start back up, they're going to be very progressive. So you really want to be under um, expertise care. So that's a focal seizure. And generalized is it starts um, in the center of the brain and it goes up and it, and it encompasses both of the hemispheres. So you can see a generalized seizure involves the entire brain, like a tonic-clonic seizure and a focal seizure, also known as partial, it can start usually in the temporal lobes or the frontal lobes or parietal lobe, and then it spreads out and starts affecting the other area. So what you don't want it to do is start damaging the brain, and the more area it affects, then the more damage it can cause. So you really want to stop the seizure from expanding. And you really want to stop it, if you can, to go into a tonic-clonic seizure, because they're the most dangerous seizure. Any questions? Okay. So um, we send, like I said, all of our um, families that call, we send them to um, epilepsy centers, because look at all the different seizure types, and then the syndromes which are associated with epilepsy. There are a lot, and it is a lot of scientific and precise um, work to try to track down the cause of seizures. So that was partial and now we have generalized, just an example of some of the generalized seizures and some of the um, uh, syn um, syndromes. And there are many dual diagnoses. For instance, autism um, diagnosed in approximately 30% of individuals Epilepsy is diagnosed in approximately 30% of individuals with autism, especially the more severely affected. And that's from our Center of Autism and Neurodevelopmental Disorders in Orange County. Um, cerebral palsy, approximately 50% of children with CP have seizures at some point in their life. And that's for the, from the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Down syndrome, eight to 10% will have some form of seizures and that's from the National Down Syndrome Congress. Any questions about the dual diagnoses? Seizure recognition. Um, partial seizures begin and involve only one part of the brain, and the symptoms related to that part of the brain where seizures start and spread. We talked about the simple and complex, and they can spread, they can stay in their own area, but um, usually if you don't get your seizures, under control by puberty, then chances are they're going to be lifelong. And so we really want kids with epilepsy to be seizure-free as soon as possible so they don't become teens with epilepsy. And if you're a teen with epilepsy, chances are you're going to become an adult with epilepsy. So why not send them to the highest level care, level four um, epilepsy centers, so they can be very assertive as far as stopping the seizures. And then they have the entire menu of um, treatments. Um, 
seizure recognition and first aid for non-convulsive seizure. Um, you're looking for a change in the level of consciousness, a dull affect, um, blank staring, non-purposeful movements, aimlessness, chewing motions, or lip smacking. And you'll stay, you want to stay calm and start timing the seizure. You don't want to restrain. You redirect from or remove hazards. Speak calmly to the person. And as a person returns to full consciousness, help to reorient person to surroundings. They're not going to be able to talk right away, so you do the talking. And don't give them food or water. And don't leave them unsupervised um, until they are back to their full level of awareness. And that can take a couple hours. And you want to keep them under your supervision for about 24 hours because the chance of having another seizure is um, more uh, prevalent right after a seizure. So they'll, they will need to be supervised. If a seizure lasts longer than five minutes, um, if you have diastat from your doctor and you follow the prescription, most diastat prescriptions are five minutes, some are four, some are three, some are two, so follow the directions. Um, or you can call 911. And a first time seizure, it's always 911. So if someone has a first time seizure, someone's pregnant, someone has a seizure in the water, it's always 911. Um, so generalized seizures involve the whole brain. Symptoms may include convulsions, muscle spasms, falls, and brief staring episodes. Um, and um, generalized seizures. Um, most of the time they're not coming from a focal point in the brain, but um, there are many brain diseases and genetic disorders where um, it causes uh, generalized seizures. Okay, so first aid for a tonic-clonic convulsive seizure is um, look for loss of consciousness, consciousness falling, stiffening or jerky movements, stay calm and start timing the seizure, roll person on his or her side to prevent aspiration. So. Um, the brain continues to make, to generate saliva, and we just um, automatically swallow excess saliva. But when someone's having a seizure, um, and it could be a complex partial seizure, depending on how much of the brain is involved, or a tonic-clonic seizure, then um, chances are they're not going to be able to swallow the saliva, so you need to turn them to their side. And the reason why you want to turn them to their side is so that the excess saliva can naturally flow out. Because at the end of a seizure, when someone regains their consciousness, they usually take a big deep breath. And, and if, this, if they haven't been rolled over to their side and they're on their back, then that saliva may aspirate into their lungs and then we'll have another emergency. So it's always important to tell people why you turn them to their side so that you're affecting the change and the goal is so the excess saliva um, can naturally flow. Um, you want to cushion their head, remove glasses, and loosen tight neckwear. Keep airway clear for natural expulsion. Make sure hands and legs are not hitting anything. Remove obstacles, furniture, and anything that can cause bodily harm. Do not restrain. Check for medical ID for epilepsy. And again, if seizure lasts longer than five minutes, call 911. Seizure don'ts. Do not put anything in their mouth. Um, do not give oral medication during a seizure unless your epileptologist um, gives you emergency oral medication. So it's too late to give a pill. If you're late on your medication, it's too late to stuff it in their mouth. Um, you don't want to restrain. You want to turn them on their side. And then don't give food or drink until a person is fully conscious. Any questions about that? First aid? Okay. Seizure dues. If a seizure lasts longer than five minutes, call 911. Follow the patient's seizure plan. So um, our pediatric epilepsy center gives everyone a seizure plan upon leaving the hospital. If they've been diagnosed with epilepsy, and so that goes to the school district and they follow the seizure plan, which makes it really wonderful for everyone and lowers everyone's um, stress threshold. So it's a great um, system and um, it comes straight from the doctor, and I believe it goes straight to the school. Do you know if it does, Megan, do they email it, or do they send it? Um, and so, yeah, and so, and the parents get one too, but at least the school officials, because they have their,
protocol and they have their insurance, etc. They have to follow the guidelines of the doctor. So it's really important that they get the seizure, um, the seizure plan. Yes. Their own seizure plan. Um, I think that's a really good question, Patty, is the doctor will send the medical plan and then through the IEP, the parents will say, write this in the IEP, you know, and then they'll put, you know, don't get overheated, don't, you know, um, don't have them out if it's past, if it's over 95 degrees outside. And so that's when the parents come in and write down all of their triggers that the doctors may not know about. Um, but we've been really, we've been really um, lucky because um, sending people to epilepsy centers, a lot of them are getting such great seizure control. A lot of those things are going away. It's it's really good, it's really good. Um, so when you call 911, first time seizure, um, no medical ID and no known history of seizures, seizure in water, pregnant woman having a seizure, convulsive seizure lasting longer than five minutes, not rega regaining consciousness, more seizures than usual, or a change in seizure type, normal breathing, does not resume, requested an individual seizure plan, okay, um, Dual diagnosis or medically fragile. If you can't tell if it's an asthma attack, a seizure, um, or you know a low blood sugar event, then definitely just call 911 because it's too complex. That's what we're telling our um, teachers and our school administrators. Okay, so epilepsy comorbidities. This is why we're so passionate about stopping seizures because prolonged seizures, um, not getting seizures under control, we're seeing 57% um, of the population with anxiety about their seizures and their future and when they're gonna have a seizure, if they're gonna have a seizure in front of their friends, um, they're not going out on weekends, they become forgotten and isolated. Depression, about 43%, and suicidal risk is about 13%. And that's from the uh, Director of Pediatric Psychiatry at CHOC, um, the stats that they got from our community. So, and you can see that um, if you can get the seizures under control, then you can work on the anxiety and depression and suicidal risk, but um, it usually is commensurate with how long the seizures are lasting. So if someone has seizures for three or four or five years and they lose hope getting seizure control, but if you get the seizures under control pretty quickly, then this seems to be decreased the comorbidities. Okay, so our take-home message. Seizures must be stopped as soon as possible. Seizures are detrimental to the brain and, it's, and the brain's normal development. Seizures cause more seizures. Um, what does Dr. Z say? The, mo the, the cells that seize together... The cells that network together uh, seize together. Um, independence is severely compromised and commensurate with seizure frequency. Epilepsy centers are best hope for seizure control and we are here to help with all of the above. It's a lot to take in, it's a lot to remember. Um, it is really hard scientific stuff. Um, epilepsy is um, very complex so the most important thing are epilepsy centers, um, epilepsy specialists, and epileptologists because epileptologists run epilepsy centers. And why do we do what we do? Compassion drives our organization to urgently help children, teens, and adults find relief from seizures. And we are inspired by our members. And so these are our success stories um, that inspire us to keep going. And they're so cute. <laughs> Um, and then that's my daughter and she is the inspiration of why I'm doing what I'm doing because I understand how difficult it is to um, you know deal with epilepsy try to learn 
be on a learning curve, making all the mistakes, and not being able to go back and fix them. So we try to help our families um, get to the answers as quickly as possible. Any questions? Any questions? Yes. That's the that's the million dollar question. So it all depends on your diagnosis, and and as you can see, when we had all the diagnosis up there, is we don't diagnose. Um, we do is we send them to the specialist and with this urgency of getting the seizures under control. And if they have seizure control medication, that's wonderful. Um, yes. Well, if you get it under control, and then you're able to come off medication. So that's what I'm saying. So there's a, um, and this, there are many ways to get your seizures under control. So there's medication, um, there's surgery, um, different treatments, ketogenic diet, and it really all depends on the um, diagnosis. So you gotta have your diagnosis, and then the doctors will say, this medication or this treatment works best on this diagnosis. So you go to the most effective treatment and then if there are no other brain problems, um, and that's difficult if you have a focal point because that usually generates seizures, um, but if there are no, no other brain problems and you have a healthy brain, then sometimes the medication can normalize the brain waves. And then um, for young children with generalized epilepsies, um, they are seizure free to two to three years and the doctors will sometimes try to take them off medication to see if they can handle that. Um, but it has to be done scientifically with an EEG. You just can't guess. You have to look at the brain and say, hmm, how's that brain acting? Is it still trying to seize? Are there subclinical seizures? Are there epileptiform, epileptiform discharges? going on so that it looks like it's trying to see so the medication needs to stay so the scientific the better just to keep everyone safe when they're younger <laughs> because the brain is developing and the brain's learning how to behave. So you put the, you, um, and depending on their diagnosis, so if they have um, epilepsy and they stop having seizures and the EEG is clean. So you have to talk to your doctor about that, yes. So, and that's what's really important and it's really complex and that's why you have to go, you know, we say go to epilepsy specialists because you want to know exactly what's going on in that brain. And is it gonna be a lifelong epilepsy? Is it going to be a pediatric epilepsy? Um, and you know, the syndromes dictate that if it's a syndrome. So um, you wanna know exactly what type of epilepsy you have too. That's very, very helpful. Any other questions? Are you gonna ask a question, Megan? <laughs> you look like you're gonna ask a question. Any questions in the back? No? Don't be afraid, you can ask a question. I'll answer it if I can. Yeah, catamenial. Um, well, I, um, if you can get the seizures, and, and what we try to do is, is our parents and our group like to help other parents through it and say, try to get the seizures under control before puberty. Some seizures, some epilepsies get better 
many times they get worse during puberty. So good intention people will tell you, don't worry, your kid's gonna grow out of it during puberty. Not so, you gotta see what type of seizure type you have, right? And if the seizures aren't under control, um, chances are they might get worse. So um, there's catamenial epilepsy and the hormone fluctuation during menses can increase seizures at the beginning of the period and then at the end when you have that big drop. And so if you're seeing that, then you gotta to talk to your doctors, hopefully an epileptologist who has an expertise in catamenial epilepsy, and sometimes they try to, um, you know, um, manage that with stopping periods, etc. but I don't know what type of seizure it is. Um, but it is very common, and um, Dr. Morell, who's the expert on, you can look her up, Dr. Martha Morell, who's the expert on catamenial epilepsy, and I think she's at UCSF. Is that right, Patty? UC Stanford, maybe? Um, she's up there. <laughs> and uh, um, it's like 55% of women that have epilepsy have increased seizures. So it's a huge deal. And um, we need to do a better job of educating OBGYNs and for them to understand that because, uh, you know, we need the whole team working on that. And those are, sometimes those are, you know, the worst seizures during, you know, their seizure history. Catamenial seizures? Um, it just means that you're having seizures during your cycle. And so they're going to be the same seizures probably, but maybe a little bit longer, maybe increased frequency. So if they're having tonic-clonic, if you're having absence, if you're having focal, then you may have more of those. Does that make sense? So, and this is all general, so I don't, I don't want to... Um, seizures are a symptom of epilepsy. So two or more seizures that are unprovoked. That, so it's not a high fever, it's not a new medication, um, it's not, you know, um, a change in environment or something, um, then what you have to look at is if you can't figure out what's causing the seizures, two or more unprovoked seizures is epilepsy. So seizures are the symptom of epilepsy. So epilepsy is the big, huge word in the scientific nomenclature, and all the seizures, absence, tonic, clonic, um, partial, uh, we have um, simple and complex and infantile spasms, and all the different types of seizures are under the umbrella of epilepsy. Does that make sense? So it's like cancer, and then all the different types of cancer, if you look at, if you compare it that way. Good questions, very good questions. Anything else, any other questions? Am I done, am I up with my time? <laughs> okay, thank you, and, and I hope that you learned a little something about epilepsy.